Michelle. Daniel. OG, OG Rose. Rose. And today we're going to be talking about ontological design. Subject is Project by Daniel Frega. He has recently released this book, and it is a wonderful book. Michelle and I have enjoyed it very much, and it's about some very important topics and very important issues. Uh, we put did a review that's called The Call to Design, which is uh, a play on the series Call of Duty. It's a video game series. It couldn't resist. <laughs> could not resist. Um, but it's also a call because there's this cry through the book of design or be designed. There is no other option. You are always, already in the middle of a conflict for the design of human subjectivity. There are algorithms that are collecting data about you. There are scanners, sensors that is gathering your data and information and that is shaping and influencing you. And this does allude to that classic idea that is attributed to McLuhan, but I actually think it comes from a um, preacher or pastor of some, I can't remember his name, which is the whole idea of we make our tools and then our tools make us. And certainly that idea is present here, but it but it's like cranked up a hundred times, <laughs> like it's really cranked up a notch. Um, because, you know, the hammer makes you when you use it, but now you have algorithms, information gathering that's occurring even if you're not using it, even if you don't know that it's going down. And it's profoundly transforming the very way that you take in the world. Um, we have that paper representing beauty that talks about once you invent the camera, you can then think of the, the, the tree or the sunset as a picture, as a potential picture. Before the invention of the camera, you couldn't think of a, a sunset as a potential photograph. Now you're like, oh, that could be a picture. Technology always changes towardness. It always changes our orientation, and it always changes the possibilities of the things around us. Um, well, this has just, again, been cranked up cranked up a thousand times. Now you have these different technologies that are really working on a subconsciously transforming the way, uh, you know, people talk about attention deficit disorder, for example, that is tied to technologies. Um, there's all the mental health stuff that comes with social media. All of these would be examples of ways that technology is changing our towardness. And Mr. Frega, throughout his book, really explores how profoundly this occurs and all the different ways that it's occurring that many people don't even really realize is happening. Yeah, no, I really, really appreciate um, Daniel Frega's perspective and his incredible insights and examples of, you know, how how t technology uh, shapes our towardness, you know, mm -hmm. toward reality, toward ourselves and our existence, and you know, our just really how we operate in the world. Oh, yeah. It's it, it's no way to have technology and it just sort of be in a vacuum or something like mm -hmm. that. Like mm -hmm. it's always that we're in a nexus with uh, with technology. And it does shape our understandings of everything, really. Oh, yeah. And I, I was thinking more on the idea of, you know, the hammer for, you know, because mm. there, a hammer is a type of technology, oh, sure. right? But the thing is, is that while it could potentially create like an atmosphere, it's different than uh, the internet or something. Like the web, I always think that's an interesting word because mm. it's like being, you know, you're in a web. Well, web. What, what's in a web? Well, like a uh, pray. You know, ah, yeah. um, pray for a spider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's you're caught in it in a sense. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more difficult to get untethered from that. Whereas you know the hammer puts you put it in the toolbox in the tool shed. It doesn't like it doesn't ping you in the middle of the night, hmm, hmm. like you know say notifications would for uh, social media or some, mm, something like mm. that. And yes, you can choose to turn them off, right? Uh, there are ways in which you can still control certain things, oh, sure. but the but there's no getting around the fact that it does influence your value system, your you know your way of being, and and you know they their apparatuses. I mean that's what I also think is always interesting. The idea of app, you know, the word app, mm. another word in in this whole tech space. Mm. It's like um, the app is an appendage, mm. you know, and I think uh, Daniel Frigo will often talk about technologies in a way that is like, um, you know, these arms almost like these extensions. Mm. And, um, I, I do think that it's, it's important to kind of be aware of the language that's used cause it's very telling that it's definitely an incorporation of these technologies into our, if I, I always think that word is interesting because, you know, corp would be like Latin for body. So there's really kind of a internalization of these technologies. Um, into almost our very fabric. Well, he has that story toward the beginning where he talks about if you had someone 
who remembered how to get to the store, and then you had someone who had very bad memory, but they had a cell phone that told them how to get to the the store. Mm-hmm. There, practically speaking, there's no difference. Yep. You know, there. You know, one of them just contains the cognition inside their brain; the other person holds it in their hand. But practically speaking, there's little difference. And he does a very good job of breaking down the idea that technology is other from us. Um, and, uh, you know, what you were saying on the pinging, well, well, yeah, you can turn it off, but then you know that people know you turned it off. Exactly. Um, and you know you turned it off. And you know you turned it off. Yeah. So what kind of person are you to not want to receive notifications from your friends? <laughs> you know, possibilities, even if you don't use those possibilities or realize those possibilities, you still know are possibilities. So they affect you psychologically. There's yes. always existential consequences for the gaining of possibility. If you don't use those notifications, then what could, you know, do you not care about hearing from your friends? Do you not care about, uh, you know, keeping up to date with what's going on in people's lives? What kind of person are you? <laughs> you know, there's always a pressure um, that, that is used and you start thinking about what other people think. And then you have the whole game of you know, if you don't reply quick enough to messages that you receive, what kind of person are you? What are they thinking about because you didn't receive? So there's this whole um, game theory dynamic that technology introduces that shapes you subjectively, that changes how you define a good friend, that def- that changes how you define someone who's up to date and keeping up with friends. You know, in a world where you can only write letters, keeping up with a friend would be, say, mailing them a letter maybe once a month or something. But now the definition of keeping up with friends is three messages a day, you know. And so your value of keeping up with friends transforms relative to technology. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad. Technology is always a Faustian bargain. It's it's always a trade-off. You get goods and bads. Mm -hmm. Um, But it creates – it transforms what we think of as a friend who's who's up to date because you you have those no possibilities that are open to you. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think that the the idea, uh, you know, which is so good and rings out through the book about, you know, design or be designed could speak to this because th- this new valuation system or this new possibility of how people engage with each other is, you know, heavily impacted by technology. Mm. Um, you know, it can like you're saying there there can be uh, pros and cons to that. But the more you're aware of your own agency in designing and using these things and these, uh, you know, options and technologies for a particular purpose, the more that I think you have at least a little bit of an upper hand, you know, you can, you can start to be able to use uh, technologies for, for really for good. I mean, there's so sure. many incredible opportunities connecting with people you may never have otherwise been able to connect with mm. because of the internet that are in different places in the, in the country or the world. You know, these are really, really, really wonderful. Uh, there, that's a gift in, in many ways. You, you have many opportunities you would not have otherwise had. Oh, sure. Um, and that's wonderful if you have a purpose already. Like, right. if you have a purpose within yourself of I have this particular goal that's overarching that I, you know, I can tie, um, I can tie these opportunities into or use. I can use my purpose as a direction for these opportunities. That that's kind of like your ability to design, right? Oh, but yeah. you, if you're going to design, what does a designer have? They have a plan. They have a blueprint, right? Oh, and yeah. so I think I think that something that informs this idea of design or be designed is the the underlying purpose behind what you do, and then it can give you a better sense of being able to use these technologies as really great resources, um, and versus being like utterly fragmented by them and displaced and you know overwhelmed. No, I think that I think that's very important, and I think it suggests why you know Mr. Frager wants to emphasize that this age of ontological design is again different than say past technologies that of course designed us as we designed them, but it, it's cranked up a notch. And I I think um, to the point that you're making there is a hammer. When you pick up a hammer, the the, the purpose of which you're supposed to use use it for is more given. It's yes, more kind of given. Yep. Um, when you um, turn on air conditioning or you get air conditioning, you know, we can go through all these different electricity. You can go through these technology. There's a sense in which the purpose is more evident. It's yes. more linear. It's more clear. The problem is like, what is the purpose of social media? What is the purpose of the internet? It's much more open. 
way more open. There's way more possibilities, which in one sense is good because there's more individual customization. There's more creative possibility. But in another sense, it's it's easy to use them without thinking like what your purpose is. Whereas if you go to pick up the hammer and you didn't think about what your purpose was going to be before you picked up the hammer, well, it would almost, it would almost just by what it was bind the level of uses that you could have for it. You could, you would, um, it would kind of give you a purpose and it's very facticity or bind the possibility, but it's not the case with, with the digital, um, horizons that we have now. Well, it's interesting to think about that a little further. If we think about a hammer, you know, its shape, its literal, its design. Mm. Actually, if you look at it, mm. if you pick it up, right, you feel the weight of the mm. the um, the mallet end of the hammer, right. You feel the kind of gravity it has. Um, it's it has. What I want to say is, like to your point, Daniel, it it has its purpose almost in its actual design. You can yeah. see that it's yeah. like. Okay, Much I, more I might not never. I may never have seen this tool before. Like you know, you go 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 to some sure. museums of like archaic, um, like archaeology digs and stuff mm. like that. You'll see different tools and things that you know you may have never have seen. Sure. But like this particular uh, tribal group made this thing, this particular tool mm. or whatever, mm. and you're just like looking at it. You're like, oh, that's so fascinating. Wow, they found this and this. But it's like you can gather more or less that oh, that was like a vase, you know, or sure, because sure. of its shape, it's just sure. like its design. So basically, you look at a hammer, you kind of get a sense of what it's about. It's going to hit stuff. Yeah. yeah <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's basically you can use this to hit stuff. Right. I'm not sure why. You're not sure if you're building or destroying. Sure. sure. So you look at a phone. Mm. You look at an iPhone or a smartphone. It's it's um it's a little rectangle. Hmm. Hmm. It's like yeah. Space Odyssey 2001 or something. Yeah, like there's something very interesting about this, I think. But there's a, some there's something fascinating in, you know, we all know now like that a little square thing is is a phone that ha- yes. can, can 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 connect you to the internet da da da. But but what about its like actual shape and oh, design? Sure shows really anything about what it can do. So, I mean, a screen doesn't tell you anything. There's something, I mean, it's not wait, even there's a something phone very anymore. Flat, yes. There's something very flat about what you can gather from it. But but that's the other thing, too, though. It kind of becomes, a, it be, kind of becomes I want to say a Pandora's box. It's that's an not, X variable. It's, not the, it's an X variable. That's a good way to put it. Or it's like this kind of, it's like this, it's like an endless machine yes. of, like, possibilities. Yes. It's like this endless, it's, it's like a complete just blank check it's like a blank check or like a plethora of things because the other thing too is that the phone or you know with these apps you know that have the internet now it's not just used for you know problem solution in terms of like something very physical now now the phone can be used for both work and leisure oh yes the the phone can be used for both work and like satisfying your boredom or whatever and so it's very it's much less clear about what this tool is for and if it's really again, if if it's like, what is the express purpose of this? Is is not? It's not contained. There's no. There's very le- mu- there's much. There's much less binding to it. There's much less binding, and that's why you know, as Frig is talking about, like it's kicked up so many notches because Absolutely. now we are working with this like again X variable. Well, it, it, it a hammer would not. Um... Uh, open new opportunities, but you can get on the internet and learn about new jobs. You can get on the internet and meet new people. Um, so a hammer would not do that for you. Uh, a, a hammer would, you would use it to hit a nail. You would use it to hit something with. But now what you're doing is you're designing these technologies that indeed can do what you want. They are an X variable. You can use a phone as a computer. You can use it for your business. You can use it for your social interactions. You can use it to learn. You can use it to do or play addictive games like Candy Crush. You can, it's an X variable. There's a lot of things that it could do. Um, and in that X variableness, kind of what Mr. Frager would get, precisely because the human essence, the human subjectivity is also kind of an X variable. It can be made and shaped and transformed, Mm -hmm. you have this very powerful feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Whereas even if the human subjectivity was always shapeable, um, there was only so much the hammer could do to it. Um, Even if maybe you pick up the hammer and you feel powerful because you're holding it and you start saying, yeah, I'm I'm a tradesman, I can do that. You start defining (laughs) things that you could yourself in terms of what you could do with a hammer. Well, again, the hammer gave you direction of where you would define your essence. It would define your essence or subjectivity in the direction of someone who hit things, just like you said. But now you pick up the phone and it's an X variable and you go, what should I do with it? And you, you, and yeah. it doesn't reply, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so you you just start using it 
But then that means there's not a it's not a two sided dialectic that's balanced where you have some subjectivity that's balancing with the phone and the, or the tool and the tool is balancing with your subjectivity. Now it's just a complete X variable, but it's actually working on you. It's not as much of a blank check as it seems because the corporations and the algorithms and different things have ways of shaping you as you use it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but but the reason it's so good at shaping you is precisely because it doesn't give you a clear direction. So you just kind of kind of wander in just mm -hmm. fiddling around with different things just like it wants you to so that it can feed you signals so it can send mm -hmm. you in certain directions to shape you as 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 it so desires yeah that's an inter that's an interesting point you said how it doesn't like uh it's something about like it doesn't respond what was that phrasing you used something about like how um you know it doesn't really reply but it's funny because like phones actually talk and stuff like there's oh, all sure, sorts of sounds sure, coming sure, out of them. Sure, sure. but but the yeah, but but the irony is is that that that's like there's so much that comes out of phones, right? That yes. that it's um it's almost less re uh, responsive, like a hammer would be, Absolutely. which is silent. You the know, responses that's, like, are coming through the object. Yeah, like, exactly. The object not itself through, is not the source right. of the the information, but what comes through the object. Yes. So then the object becomes invisible to you, and you don't realize that that is that thing is actually there working on you. It's kind exactly. of hidden behind the the responses. Mm -hmm. The information coming out of it, you lose sight of the thing that it's actually coming out of. Yeah, and actually, like in the hammer being silent, well, it, it you know when it's like hitting nails and things, it's not so silent. But you sure. know, it's like it's funny. The sounds it makes are very particular to the job it does, and mm. um, and also using a hammer, you would have certain physical feelings in your arm, like strengthening in, in your forearm or something like that. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah. there's like, that there's would actual... remind you there's a body. Yeah. Well, yeah, which remind you that, 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 that you have a body. And also that would remind you that, you know, oh, right. I use this to build or whatever, you yeah. know? Um, but yes, I do. I do think there's this like very strange, because I've thought a lot about this with, especially with, with smartphones, the idea of like just a single, you touch for everything. Like it's just this tiny little tap that just does so much. Mm. It's like this magic touch or something. Um, and, and I do, I do think that that's a very interesting point you're making too, Daniel, with the, with the idea of the blank check, but it's actually not, it's kind of like you're, there are these signals, right? Mm. It's like you're in this kind of, you stumble in into this yeah. kind of blank check of like endless possibilities, but really there are certain, there are certain uh, gravitations that, that, Absolutely. you know, that tech companies and other places want, want you to do or mm. want you to be sucked into or whatever. And, um, oh, I was just thinking about it. It's interesting. Cause like design, the word itself is like, it's, it's, design like there's the word sign and signal hmm. is actually in design yeah. yeah 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 um so so i don't know i think that's kind of interesting there's something about like it being a sign like you know there's it's a kind of like the signs of the time etc etc sure. sign are pointing you the direction exactly, to go in. exactly right but it's always like it's this all signs are a design of something in, in a in a way Oh yeah, well that's so. You're always already either being designed exactly. or designing. Exactly. You're you're always in it. Yeah. Um, well, and again, what's very interesting is in this. If we keep with the example of the phone and it being a kind of blank check and it being kind of an an, an X variable, um, okay, I'm say when we it, it's precisely because it is an X variable um, that it designed you so much. That's what's kind of paradoxical. You would think that something that had a more solid direction like the hammer would desire you more because isn't that kind of more, dare I say, totalitarian, more forceful? It's kind of forcing you in a way. So you would think that that would design your subjectivity more. But actually, the ways in which it can design you are more bound. They're more limited. They're, yes, they're more forceful because you have to use the hammer to hit a nail. But it's almost like the designing is therefore kept in the external object yes. precisely because because you can more clearly draw the line between you and it. Mm -hmm. Now, you can never completely separate yourself from the external world. That's a huge point that Mr. Frega is is making. Mm -hmm. um, but precisely when you have a hammer that has, in its very shape, as you're saying, Michelle, has a clearer use, it's, mm -hmm. it's more easy to separate yourself from the object or externalize mm -hmm. it. What's curious is with yeah. things like the phone and being an X variable, um, it, precisely in being so open in its possibility, it is more difficult to separate from you as a subject to draw the line. So that's why it designs you and works on you so, so, so much and so effectively. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. All that you said there, Daniel. And I think that, um, yeah, I just, I guess I kept on thinking about like the X variable about the human subject and then the X variable of the phone. I'm like, is this just like an eternal regression? Like they're facing each other. Oh, sure. Sure, um, sure. 
I mean, there is a bit of that that can happen, I think, um, sometimes, uh, just because what do you get when you collide to, to X variables, in a sense? Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Well, it becomes a very accelerated feedback loop. It becomes yeah, yeah. like two Which mirrors is... facing one another, and mm -hmm. you get this boom, mm -hmm. endless hallways. Mm -hmm. Because, in a sense, what the phone endless performs, subject. you know, what the... What the um, phone performs for you is a subjectivity and your subjectivity observing a subjectivity you know because basically all the information that comes out of the phone especially if we're talking social media or voices or internet is human created yeah. so there's this kind of um subjectivities reflecting on subjectivities and then we can get into you know it'd be a different subject the ontology of say zizek or lack or different things mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. that's these two um you know these lacks these openings these holes that are then feeding off one another trying to fill one another and, and it, it, it accelerates quite rapidly in right. the formation um feedback loop that they have on one another right. yeah and i mean because the phone is unbound and it's kind of has this lack property um to it this openness you're constantly trying to fill it you know your subjectivity is naturally trying to fill it well it can never do it and so you're always pouring yourself into it always creating and being created as you do that pouring and it never ends it never stops whereas if you were to try to say pour your subjectivity into a hammer you know it would be limited by the fact that it, the freaking thing is used for hitting stuff <laughs> you know th there would be a certain binding of what you could imagine using it for maybe you could hit the door maybe you could hit the uh, the garage the pavement but eventually you you know there's a there's a limitation to the ways that can shape you but when you have an x variable um, you can you can just keep you can just keep going forever and ever and and so you get this very powerful feedback loop. Yeah, definitely. And I think that feedback loop, the the the, the mirror facing mirror, the two subjectivities, the up x variables facing each other reminds me of um, of the paper at the beginning of reconstructing AZ. Right. Um, which I thought was really a great point. Just this idea that the human, the subject, and the paradox of the human subject. Right. Um, and how that is something that we have to kind of deal with our existential state of being that's right. uh, like the, the eternal regression, basically. Oh, yeah, um, that's right. And I, I think, too, uh, you know, so, somebody could like push back a little bit with the hammer and say, like, well, you know, um, the hammer, you know, can both destroy and build. Sure. Just like an iPhone, you know, you can do destructive things or you can do building things on of course. it, con constructive yes, yes. things on it. Yes. Um, so, so yes, that is true. But it's more easy to tell with a hammer what even constitutes destructive. You know, with a phone, it's yeah. not even clear what it's it means not. to be destructive. Exactly. Are you destroying your brain by using social media all day or are you building your business? You know, yeah. that's, that's exactly. part of the issue is that it's not actually clear what yeah. is destructive. Um, you know, he makes examples in the book of some of the um, of some of the uh, information data gathering corporations, and you know that one that does politics. Uh, you know, they basically claim they have like five bills, some crazy number of data points about every single American. Um, it, so they have, so they're able to very. Um, effectively target voters, figure out what kind of um, ads they need to do to get people to um, not vote or vote whatever is in their interest, and that they can calibrate the targeting based on that. And then, if, you know, if, you, if you're not necessarily determining what people are going to do, but once you get a certain probability, you know, you just use probability theory and you can greatly increase the likelihood that whatever outcome you want comes to pass simply by using probability theory and... and um, adjusting the edge accordingly. Well, I promise you that um, people, whatever people did to create those data points, they didn't know they were creating those data points when they were using social media or the internet or whatever. Um, they didn't know that they were contributing to this profile that would be used to, dare I say, manipulate them into a certain political outcome. So it's not clear what constitutes danger. That's part of the whole problem is you're, you're, not, you're, you're not aware that you're even entering into dangerous waters. Exactly. Whereas if I take a hammer, and I throw it through the air, I know this is now possibly dangerous if it accidentally lands on someone. Yeah, no, great point, great point. Yeah, no, and I, I think too, like I, I just, I really do love how Daniel Frega really gets into how how steeped we already are, you know, in, yeah. in the kind of connection and, you know, entwinedness of technology and our, our human existence. Um, you know, you could just think about, like I, I thought that was also interesting when he talked about like how you know, there's more of a sense of individual because of like mass production of doorknobs and stuff like that. You <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And yeah. how people can have like individual rooms for a nu nuclear family. Yeah, that was excellent. And things like that. Really so, like that. so it's just it's just pretty profound. I mean, this is a very very profound idea. And um, if if we aren't if if we just simply don't have the awareness about that, we we will be very caught off guard. I think 
by those who are, you know, making the things and making the inventions and the, the technologies. Um, so um, if we want to have some sense of, uh, you know, like um, Second Amendment toward that or some sort of protection, um, it's almost like, look, we're all we're actually all creative in nature inherently as humans. We create our days. We create our days with our attitude, our decisions, our, you know, what whatever we choose to do. Um, so we have to kind of like, just as the problems ramping up in a sense, we have to ramp up our creativity, I think, uh, in order and, and, and a sense of agency and design, you know, again, there's, there's something that, you know, th there could be questions of like, well, is it too late? Is it, is, is it, is, sure. is it too much to fight? Da, da, da. Well, there's really no option. And, um, no. but at least there's something that, you know, there is a, you know, it's kind of like knowing you're going to battle. Is is that like, how do you feel about that? It's, it's like, it's hard, but it's also, it's like, well, you know what, you know, you're fighting and you're kind of like, you won't go down without a fight. <laughs> and well, so I think that's, that's, an, there's something that can be encouraging in the midst of, of possibly a overwhelming kind of realizations about this sure. enmeshment of the technology and human. human. Well, if the corporations have the technology to, you know, the, one of the things Mr. Frager would stress is if the technology exists to shape human subjectivity as such, then that means the technology exists for us to use to shape our human subjectivity mm -hmm. as we would like. Yes. Uh, that it is within the realm of possibility that we could um, own these capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, another whole side to this conversation, this is what he'll get in um, later in the book, is the certain psychological, and patho um, psychological difficulty of how do you, say, design yourself? Like, that's a very hefty responsibility. Like, if you can be anyone, like, truly be, you know, everyone always talks about be, you can be whoever you want. Right. Well, if that was actually true on the deepest ontological level, um, that is a radical encounter with um, the real, as Lacan would say. I mean, it would be existentially overwhelming and terrifying. So, you know, and he's going to he's going to elaborate on that in important ways. That's a that's a the very infinite possibilities of onto, of ontological design requires a facing of the real pathos of human possibility, which is something we usually don't appreciate. In fact. We tend to think that the the better we develop technology, the less we'll have to deal with human pathos because it will solve it. It will um, okay. solve, you know, the problems of the human of the human in general, and that we include the psychology. So we don't. But actually, the truth of the matter is, the better your technology you create, the more you're forced to face yep. the the human in in all of his and her pathology, subjectivity, neuroses and difficulties. And so that that's an, a very important move because very often when people talk about or you can read some of these books on new technologies, they don't talk about the psychological challenge that the new technologies will make. They focus on how, hey, we're gonna have self driving cars. Ain't ain't that neat. Um they don't mention and as you're sitting in your car not driving, you're going to have to deal with feelings of how your dad drove the tr the car and, you know, you don't feel like a real man anymore because you're not driving the car yourself. And do you feel insecure about that? <laughs> you know, they're not going to mention yeah. those new pathological thoughts that are going to go through your head of how you're not going to want to use a self-driving car because it might be embarrassing or something. You know, that's a, that's a hurdle that has to be overcome or it's going to make you reflect on yourself. Well, ontological de design, just take that example I made on self-driving cars and put it down to being about your deepest ontological dimensions. And that's not always appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that Mr. Frege brings up. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And I think, you know, it's ever since good old Postman. Oh, <laughs> sure, Neil Postman. All his great work on technology. You know, I, I, I guess it's always just been sort of, you know, struck me how, oh, wow, yeah, I guess like, you know, technology, there's, you know, you always have to kind of go on a case by case basis to, to, to assess like this technology and, it's value right, add. Right, what does right, it detract? Right. But just the idea, like you were just saying, how a lot of times, you know, your New York, New York bestseller books and stuff like are they're not really talking about the like the nuance of things. The, no. they're they're talking all pros, no cons. If they did, you they know? wouldn't be New York Times exactly. bestseller. Nobody wants to read things like this. Like, exactly. oh, I just right. want to be excited about self-driving cars. I don't want to think about the <laughs> psychological challenges of actually using it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but it's like, oh, you know, he was probably one of the first people who made me realize, huh interesting the things that are often like hailed as like modern advancements also have like trade back trade-offs yeah. you know they have like they have like their downsides too Absolutely. and um you know i just think that you know i think there is something really uh quite quite interesting and powerful about like making that acknowledgement and then you know just sort of the 
Yeah, just just to how like how Daniel Frigg is talking a lot in his book about how, you know, even the idea of like the, the, the sofa and how, you know, we, we think yes. about like relaxation differently because sitting is now not on the ground, but on, you know, a sofa, for example. Oh, yes. And, you know, just things like that where it's just wildly fascinating how how much things that are already that are created then, uh, you know, shape our sense of of self and even how you again how one even relaxes how they spend like their 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 comfort time or something like oh, that. oh yeah well you know that was a, a very good um example that he made in the book where yes. he said you know once you use the sofa when when you think about resting you think about laying in a sofa so the technology conditions what the word rest means in your head so it affects your your mental image your mental ideas and that's a very clear example of how technology changes subjectivity because you you know you think about rest is the word rest could mean anything right mm -hmm. it could mean different things to different people right. and yet technology that the society uses as a whole begins creating not hard brackets for uh what what the what people are going to think about when they think about rest, but it but it does create a kind of range that people operate in that has been conditioned and organized by the technologies. You know, you have this idea of like um, freedom, you have imprisonment, but there's also this thing like free range. Like the cattle are, they have free range in a field. They're stuck in the field. They can move around freely in the field, but they're actually not totally free. They're in, it's more like free range because right. there's a fence. Well, technology does something similar. Once everyone uses couches or say, um, watches Netflix to rest and relax, you know, once they use these technologies, then there's a kind of range of that the society operates quote unquote freely in free reigns that is all when when it considers what it wants to do to rest that is all organized and defined according to the technological use and i think that also goes back to what we we're saying about the x variable because what ends up happening is um the phone informs your idea of who you are which then when you think about who am i you say, oh, I'm a YouTube use, you know, I'm a YouTube creator, or oh, I'm that person on social media that everyone sees as the guy interested in stoicism. Oh, I'm that person who does the the cool um, '80s Renaissance paintings on my Instagram account, and so then you use Instagram more to maintain that identity, um, and so then when you think about who am I. It is partially conditioned by the, by the phone, which is not inherently bad because you know that using Instagram to do Renaissance uh, paintings. I said '80s Renaissance painting. That would not be a thing. But I was like, that's, I was listening to like, <laughs> that's really cool, Daniel. That must be some like niche, Dude, like that's like art niche, trend. Man, I tell you what. I was. Could, I mean, I, I believe you. The Italians in zebra pants. <laughs> I, I tell like, you, I want to meet the Italians in zebra pants. I, was like, I uh, could go Google uh, '80s oh, Renaissance. Wow. Need Talk like about art. examples. <laughs> At night, uh, um, but but the, but the idea is so it can be a good thing because it gives you an identity. But that identity of yourself has you doing what? Using Instagram. Well, then you're giving over data points, right? That's consequential. Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's not a bad thing. You know, when you suddenly you start getting advertisements relative to stuff that you've done on Facebook, right? Some people say that's great because they like to, you know, if they're they like the computer to know that they need a new shirt by just you know, going through all their searches and knowing they need a new shirt and it just brings up a, a, a one that they'll probably like based on their profile. Some people say that's great. Don't you like targeted marketing as opposed to a bunch of random ads on TV? Some people would say great. That's wonderful. Other people would say that's terrible because seeing those ads then pressures you to buy those items because they know that that's at your, your, your weak point per se. Um, so again, it's trade-offs. But the point is that when because the technology gives you options of what you can do what you then choose to do on that phone conditions what you think about when you think of who am i and and that's an example kind of tying it into the couch the couch point that you are making of how it shapes subjectivity yeah yeah no definitely definitely i need zebra pants now uh, i really need a need, like, like la vinci and zebra pants <laughs> I said La Vinci. This is this is grand. I hope Cadell hears this. He's like Freudian slip. I don't know what, <laughs> but yeah, there's like some that. sort of slip. Maybe maybe you played too much Super Mario Brothers and w wanted to be a diva at Super Mario Brothers. I'm not sure. Anyway, Good. La Vinci. Very nice. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that. Um... I remember asking Daniel Frega, like, well, what if you just don't want to do any of it? <laughs> like, what if you just don't, like, go be Amish or something? <laughs> he was very kind to entertain my question. 
And, um, and, he, and he was like, you're not yet? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you're not yet? Oh. It's like, I mean, I'm answering this from Carrier Pigeon. I don't know yeah, what you're using. I don't using, know what but... you're using. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it, I think that that it's really, it's really neat because kind of how it was responding was just to kind of reveal a bit about how, you know, certain things like the way we use credit cards or the way we do this, that, or the other, there's just already this, this, way of doing things that's tied into uh, technological systems, you know, yes. and, um, you know, that's a lot of times, a lot of times technologies uh, have you do that because of convenience, you know, yep. you end up doing it just because, you know, gee, that would just really be more convenient, that's you know, right. to, you know, upload this like, or whatever, d- deposit this via my phone versus having to drive out to, you know, X bank or whatever. Um, and and again, there's there's not there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but you know we we do always have to and we do always have to kind of pause. And I think that's a, a really wonderful thing that that uh, you know Daniel Frego wants wants to to encourage is to to pause and really think about what you know what are these right. technologies, what um, what am what's being done to me, and what am I doing, and um, you know I think I, the idea of of pausing to think about like what exactly am I doing and what conveniences am I taking on I've always thought about it's interesting because the word convenience makes me think about convening Mm. a lot of times convenience is at the cost of convening with other human beings and I think that's another thing where we it's it's almost like there can also be an encouragement in realizing in like, that's why I think the, the book is so great that people read this because I think there can also be an encouragement in, in many people starting to become more aware so that we don't just get into this very like, um, con- isolated convenience, uh, te- technological, um, mindset and like way of existing. Uh, we can kind of be able to have some sort of com- combating against that in our, in our convening as people who are aware of what we are doing and, and, and what's being done to us and what we can do about what's being done to us. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I just wanted oh, to yeah. mention that. Oh, too. Yeah. oh yeah. Well, I mean, the pause is a big thing. I mean, the problem is the things are basically designed so you don't pause, <laughs> so you don't stop. Um, but you know, uh, again, if we go back to that hammer example, there's something about the hammer that would kind of say to you, take your time, uh, because if you did it wrong, you would clearly hurt yourself. You'd hit your finger, you know, you'd, you'd hit someone, you'd cause an injury. Again, one of the problems with these newer technologies and being a quote unquote X variable is that it's it's not clear how you avoid harm. So you really need to pause precisely when these technologies really want to encourage you to click the next thing. Um, and I, I mean, if you just really take seriously that this thing is forming how your brain works, like on a very deep level, like it is, it is absolutely forming your values, forming the social media changes your values and ethics on what you think friendship means. The ability to email or to call someone at any point, at any moment of any day, changes your definition of what it means to communicate with people. Um, your ability to watch YouTube think YouTube videos of on all the great philosophers of all of history transforms your idea of how you should spend your time. Um, all of these things are radically transforming you. And do you want to be so changed? Do you want to be changed? Right. Um, uh, you know, is this what you want? Um, right. And and you start to ask what sort of ethics of um, because all of these things come with ethics. That's another thing that he stresses in the book is that all of this is political, because it determines like what is the right thing to do. Technology kind of um, impacts what you can define as a good use of time, as a good yes, way to yes. stay in touch with family. So yes. all of that is um, moral, and then that would have political ramifications. Um, and so. Uh, a lot of times people don't realize that these technologies are shaping their ethics and you know their 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 ideas of what love is what family what can be all these different things and do, do you need to pause and own that and know that and ask yourself are those the ethics i really want to have are those the ethics i want to embody as opposed to just absorb them and not even realize you're doing it yeah no absolutely i, I listened to a really good talk between daniel zaruba and, and javier rivera mm. on uh technology and family it was after mm. like family family symposium oh, oh. which was yeah, so, yeah, yeah. which was so great that was hosted on javier's channel right. if anyone wants to go look at it listen to it and then the the talk with daniel zaruba was on his uh daniel zaruba's youtube channel anyways the, javier and daniel were talking about uh about technologies and how i just thought it was really interesting how they brought up how 
um, maybe younger generations may have a whole different concept of of what what even like friendship means or a friend oh, sure. the word friend means because you know you have the term um, you know did you friend that person on Facebook mm. or they're my Facebook friend mm. I mean that this is this it 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 can for people who are steeped in a different generation at a different level of technology or you know uh, closeness with that technology it might seem almost like well that. That, that shouldn't really impact that much. No, it does. It yeah, impacts it does. people drastically on how they view friendship. And there's a whole new cultural engagement with friendship and, and like etiquette. And, and again, it's like politics, politeness, you know, mm. uh, with, with, with engagement mm. on social media and social messaging systems Absolutely. and stuff. Yeah. Um, technology brings with, with it phrases, language, metaphor. Absolutely. And language yes. captures you and works on you as well. So, yes. I mean, that's another just level. The hammer didn't create language. The hammer didn't really create lingo. This is again these information and and Bard will stress, you know, that these information technologies, which the phone and the internet would be, they they you know those can bring new languages and new lingos and new ways of doing things. Um, and uh, and indeed the 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 phone would would be one of that, and that's why it's so important to be aware of it because it creates these new language and metaphors matter. The metaphors you use, the languages you you use, matter and shape your cognition and how you and how you think. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 wildly fascinating. Fascinating. And yeah, just just I think I think too, like with with the word technology, if you think about what that what that roots from, you know, techni, that would be like an like craft. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Or art. Um, so it's 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 very fascinating because I guess that's too where you you know you get the idea of like uh, artificial intelligence and all of these things. Um, there's kind of a there's always something there, you know, that like Frigga will talk about, like it's always story, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's, there is something always of a crafting, you know, a crafting that's happening. In, in some ways, that can be very, very almost magical, that language. Oh, well, who use that language? And I mean, I think it's a great point. I think I, it may have been on the parallax discussion or it might have been with uh, Dr. Lass. Both of those are great discussions, by the way. Yes. Uh, there's one on Parallax and over on Goodell's channel. Excellent. But, you know, if you were to teleport someone here from 500 years ago and they were to see some of the stuff you could do with your phone, they, they'd, it, would be in, it would be indistinguishable from magic. Um, it would seem magical. And, and it's funny, you know, following uh, fairy tales or literature, if someone can do magic, they are a wizard. Like, it changes their identity. Like, the ability to do magic would change the category of the person. You would say, oh, well, they're not just a human. They're like a wizard, right? Um, so if you think about technology as magic, the fact that we can use these technologies or do these technologies or do these magics, per se, um, changes changes the kind of humans we are. It kind of changes the category of being that we fall under. We're not under the same category of humans 500 years ago who didn't have these technologies. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's funny to think, like, someone who does magic is what? They are a wizard. Uh, you know, they, they are categorized differently. Um, you yeah. know, it, but we don't think of ourselves as being under a different category from previous generations or... Um, other human beings because we have access to technology and I think that's a mistake and that's the mistake Frege wants to emphasize technology is not just an accessory it transforms categorically well I mean essentially ontologically you know, the, you know who, what what humans are yeah no so good so good and I think too it's funny because as, as you, you were talking it made me think about being okay well you know maybe everybody's like a wizard now we're like all these like superhumans because we've got this like magical sure magical abilities but it's interesting because while that while there's something of, of tr some truth to that of course uh it's almost like we could kind of uh you know i think there's there's something that you know Frigga will often talk about just in other talks and on ontological design in general too about this idea of um you know angels and demons and you know mm -hmm. it's like you can use this for it's almost like that can make you a very uh, elevated, like here's the, here's like the baseline of human. Now we're like elevated human, sure. but that also means you can be like, uh, you know, oh, like way elevated down in human. Like, yeah, you can yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. You can be angel or demon with these types of uh, devices. You know, it could be divisive with your devices, you know? Um, and, and uh, I think that, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point because while you're kind of the quote unquote superhuman who has the magic abilities, you're also basically being used by them though, you know? And so, yes. so, and also like, can you go out and make a fire? Like in the past, the real magic would be like go make fire with the elements, you know. Yeah, yeah. Go, go, like you know, there there was something kind of uh, superhuman about that. So there's there's just it's like you're kind of comparing apples and oranges when you when you start introducing new technologies. But there's kind of yes. um, 
there's kind of something very important because I think at least like we're talking about with the hammer and some of these more physical bind, bound types of things that you would be doing magic with, uh, you know, again, like, let's just say make a fire out of nothing or like Yeah, sticks. now I've got um, from In Strange Woods, Jeff's song where, uh, you know, he's like, you know, and he, he, he made a fire. I thought it was magic. I thought it would never go out. I'm trying to sing that song from Jeff's That sounded musical. great, Daniel. You yeah, it was really it good. Like, wow, just that's like, an example. Just, like, technology has not, back. yeah, technology just... has not been designing my singing voice. <laughs> uh, you know, alas, No, you, actually, it you have a back. great singing voice, Oh, that's Daniel. sweet. Thank you. Uh, so, look, In Strange Woods. In Woods, it's in really Strange great. Woods. There's a great song. I think it's, it's the second to last episode. Right? Yeah, like it's amazing. Out. Yeah, by our it's friend straight, Jeff. It's amazing. Um, so, Bam, Jeff, uh, Matt, <laughs> and Brett. Yeah. Wine, but just wonderful. Um, but uh, but the, the 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 issue is just like you're saying. So the problem is technology. Um, that's an X variable. These new technologies can be used for anything and they work on human subjectivity and in working in human subjectivity unveil the possibility of human subjectivity to be worked on. Therefore, it is not solid. Therefore, it is a becoming more than a kind of solid being. Well, that right there is psychologically disturbing. You know, if you've your entire life thought of the identity as very stable. So technology is unveiling to you that it's not. So that's one level of existential tension you have to get through. Then the second one is to go, wait a minute, um, being is not stable, so it's being designed. And wait, there are people designing my being. So that's another level of existential anxiety. And then the third level is realizing that the only way to stop it is to fight back. And therefore, you need to develop the skills immediately and the awareness immediately to start designing your being, uh, to design your becoming, per se. Well, that's a third level of existential anxiety. Um, when people are faced with radical existential anxiety, which all three of those levels would lead people into having to face, they tend to um, not respond well. <laughs> they tend to turn to totalitarianism. They turn to become neurotic. They tend to turn um, quite, quite terrible. So... Exactly your point is people can use these technologies to be angels or demons, but in order to be angels per se, as opposed to dem demons, it will require a radical amount of self-work. Well, that's, and that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's something I was thinking about at the beginning, like when I was saying how, you know, you can, you can maybe like have a leg up on using these resource these as resources like these technologies as great opportunities versus them like use you um i think it's the inner work it's it's, it's really like it's gonna it requires such a new radical level of inner work yes. um to be able to use these technologies for good and uh you know but it's like well what i don't know in some ways like that's kind of <clears throat> that's hard but it's also in a way maybe that's like it, it could actually lead to like a leveling up of the entire kind of like collective consciousness if we are if we allow it if we if we're, if we're prepared to do it yes and that's good actually uh but we have to do it then well <laughs> and that it, means and that means like literally having to fight some inner demons yes in order to be an angel in a sense with yes, this technology yes, yes, yes. well you have to fight the inner demons and the outer demons <laughs> yeah, exactly. that are trying to design you <laughs> exactly. so there's a two you know there's a <laughs> two level that's battle right. that's going that's on right. and it's and people don't even realize there's a battle going on exactly so the likelihood of that collective <laughs> leveling up is not very high yeah well it's kind of like those few like lone rangers maybe you know, oh sure 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 who, who might um, be out there you know battling battling for their life so oh sure 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 um well it it well i mean it it um it ties into what we've talked about with the meaning crisis of a sign of hope i mean you're at this kind of state now where you're not falling back on previous ways to deal with the meaning crisis but uh the the, the that gives you the fact that you're not turning to say xenophobia racism nationalism to give your self-definition of meaning means you are in a mental health crisis because people need to find new meaning and that's a negative space but precisely because you're holding yourself to a new a higher standard there's a possibility of a leveling up it's very hegelian in the sense that history progresses through a negation sublimation you know there's a negative space of a threat but if you get through it you you sublimate but of course the stakes raise as you go along and it becomes harder to progress but if you do progress it's it's better uh it's a better thing well so with ontological design here like it's it's a great challenge and very difficult to overcome but if you do it will it will indeed open up arguably a a a, a better 
world. And I, I mean, but we have to rise to the challenge. And Belonging again it talks about going through sociology, how you know you have trade offs between givens and releases, where you know today we're in a world where givens have fallen apart. So you have a lot of releases, individual freedom, individual expression, you no longer have traditions, social constructs, different things like that. So the individual is very free, but they're existentially overwhelmed. And in this environment, totalitarianism becomes appealing. And again, the whole meaning crisis thing. Um, it will be very difficult to fix the social order by going back to Givens. That will be very, very difficult. It may be the case that the only possibility is for us to own our ontological design. There may be no other solution to the problems that Belonging Again traces out. Um, that one of the reasons I like Mr. Frege's book is because it, to me, feels like it fits um, fits with the Belonging Again problems very much, mm -hmm. kind of kind of pointing mm -hmm. to what might have to be the ne the next step, mm -hmm. um, given you know the what 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 Belonging Again traces out. But but overall, it's a magnificent book that Daniel Frege has done. I think it's an important book. It's a book everyone should read. It can be found on Amazon. Um, he he is he's does wonderful work with Owen over at Techno Social. We have enjoyed the text. We've we found it really really a wonderful read. Yeah, I really we really love the book. Daniel Frege did a great job. It's incredibly well written. Very, very elegant. I yeah, think it's just an elegant. Very elo eloquently written, and we really hope that everyone will go and. and and read it. Ontological Design Subject is Project by Daniel Frega. For more by Mr. Frega, please visit Techno Social. Again, visit his Amazon. Uh, visit, uh, we mentioned it, but he's got a talk with Cadell Last, Dr. Cadell Last, on ontological design. He had a recent parallax discussion. Um, and we would highly encourage you to check those out and to purchase the book today. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com, Instagram, Anchor, Twitter, YouTube, etc., so forth. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.